Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the webinar today, which is a Q&A live with the coaches. And we have a great panel uh, for you all. And we are also going to be inviting questions. And if you've been on one of these calls before, um, feel free to send the questions to me as we speak. And we're going to hold them till, till the end because they tend to uh, get quite long. And this is about an hour in length. And uh, we're going to get started. So my name is Linda Janak. I'm the CEO of Talent Guard. We are a software and consulting company in the talent management space. And we have also Nancy Piat, and she is CEO of the, of the Piat Group. And she does quite a bit of work with, uh, in the area of organizational learning and development uh, with you know, basically Fortune 500 clients. And before that, she was at Thompson Learning as the Vice President of Training and Development. We also have uh, Betty Di Maria with us today, and she is known uh, in the industry as a, an, an organizational performance uh, consultant with uh, Aris Group. And before that, she developed the Workers' Compensation Policy Institute of New York State, and she was also the chief performance officer at, at Public Employer Risk Management Association. And then we have Brett Filson, and he is currently serving as the Executive Director of the Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Disease. He's out in Canada, and he's held numerous uh, labor relations and uh, HR um, senior roles in a variety of different companies in that area. And one thing I'd also like to mention is all of the coaches that are on the call today are coaches with a... Um, one, many credentials, but the one credential that's relevant to Talent Guard is the professional in career management. Um, so if you don't know about that, we encourage you to check it out. Uh, just a little bit on demographics. I'm always a little bit of a um, person who likes numbers. Just to kind of show you, you know, where the questions came from, the level of people that we have on the call today, and we are very thankful and overwhelmed and grateful with the response. I mean, almost 200 people registered, and uh, that's uh, one of our biggest yet. So we're very excited about that. But as you can imagine, lots of questions come with 200 uh, registrants. Company size, um, you can see the majority of them were under, under 100. And then the next largest category being 100 to 500, followed by the 500 to 1,000 groups. So, you know, we've, we've got a good representation here across the board. So um, when you submitted your questions, you submitted them in lots of different areas. And they basically broke down in about eight different categories. And because they were, they were so many, we decided that we were going to focus on four categories today, strategy, performance management, coaching, and succession planning. And the format will be each coach is going to take a particular area, and at the end you can direct your questions at a particular coach, or you can ask it of the general group. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the wand over to Nancy so that Nancy can tell us a little bit uh, more about strategy. Thanks, Linda. Hello, everyone. Greetings from lovely northern sunny Kentucky today. Our first question, how do I get executives bought into talent management if they perceive no value? Great question. I got a, a hopefully a real helpful answer. In 2009, David Foreman, who is the CLO for Human Capital Institute, published an article called Establishing a Talent-Driven Culture. In it, he describes six different approaches for making a case for talent management practices. Now, because we're on kind of a short time frame here, I won't go through all six, but do let me highlight three of these examples. The first is what he calls the business case, and you would use this approach to show the financial impact of improved talent practices. A second example is the comparative case. And you would use this case to show that others in your industries, and maybe even your competition, are taking similar actions. And you'd need your data, OK? You need to do this by benchmarking and having data that compares your business to others in the same sector or the same industry. The third example is, is my personal favorite. It's called the null case. This case will show your leaders the cost to your business of doing absolutely nothing 
about your talent management related practices. So for example, by doing nothing, your business may begin to lose momentum, morale may erode, productivity may stall, attrition may increase, your business may even miss some financial or sales opportunities. So my advice is to choose whatever approach or approaches will resonate best with your leaders and then make your best case. Now, the next question about linking strategy and the theory of talent management hits home with me. Because to me, it's as simple and as complex as my first sentence, is every aspect of talent management should be anchored in strategy. And people who know me know I'm a broken record about this. I tell people all the time, before you get started on anything related to your talent management practices, you need to be crystal clear on your business's strategies. Then you need to be aware, and if you're not, go educate yourself about the business's environment. And if you're not sure, go find out. Talk to your business development people, your chief financial officer, your CIO, maybe even your CEO. You want to read. Read anything you can get your hands on that will help you fill in your knowledge gaps about the environment in which your business operates. We're not done yet. Then you want to consider what internal or external factors may affect your business. Things like mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, reorganizations, new technology. These are just a handful of the examples of major issues that can affect your business. Now, once you're clear on the strategy and the surrounding issues, then it's time to roll up your sleeves and tackle the work on acquiring, retaining, and developing your talent. So I can't emphasize enough, every aspect of your talent management system needs to be clearly and closely aligned to your organization's strategy. Best practices on improving employee retention. This, this brings out the old HR person in me, and that's the standard old answer of, well, that depends. And it's really true. It does depend. Now, let me say this. One thing that I know that won't work is to throw a bunch of programs at a problem and then hope that something sticks. You might have some short-term improvement, but you know, in the long run, it's better to really get to the root cause of a problem. I, I like to think about retention as a symptom of a problem, not necessarily, not necessarily excuse me, the problem it's, itself. So why are people leaving? Is it your compensation program? Are the jobs and is the work boring? Is it perceived lack of advancement opportunities? Maybe they hate the parking lot. I don't know. We've heard it all, right? Maybe it's all of the above, it's none of the above, or it's something entirely different. But once you know what the problem is, then tackling that retention issue does become more solvable. Now, I'm like Linda. I like numbers. So I want to caution you, don't just go with your gut on this. You need to go out and get the data that validates those hunches and that intuition. I think I know what the problem is, okay? So here's some ideas. You want to look at your turnover. Better yet, look at your segmented turnover. Are you, for example, losing your top talent at a, at, at a greater rate than you're losing most of your other employees? Do you have poorly trained supervisors who are chewing up and spitting out their staff? Are people leaving from the field versus maybe the headquarters? And what about diversity issues? Are your Gen Yers leaving faster than any other segment? Your data will help you sort that out. Now, another idea is if you're conducting engagement surveys, go through those results with a fine-tooth comb. You want to look for trends. If you, if you solicit employee comments, which I think is some of the richest part of those engagement surveys, read those comments with a really objective eye. So the goal here is to find out why people are leaving. Look at your analytics, and then it will be clear what the problem really is, and now you'll know, have a better fix on how to solve it. Oh, the last question about, excuse me, uh, recruitment and talent management takes me back. <laughs> I started out my career many years ago as a recruiter, and while I have fond memories of it, uh, it was a tough job, and looking at what I understand the profession to be now, it's even tougher. 
But that said, I do think it's better now because recruiting is such a critical component of an integrated talent management process. Now, to get back to the original question, one of the keys to making the shift is to begin to see recruitment as talent acquisition, and it becomes the launching point for building high levels of employee engagement. Let me give you a couple of four examples. Job candidates begin forming impressions of your businesses from the moment they even apply. They'll remember things. They remember how you spoke with them on the phone, how you greeted them at an interview, how quickly you followed up regarding a second or interview. They remember this stuff. I've heard horror stories from some of my coaching clients about interview processes that they've endured. Everything from unprepared interviewers to being left sitting alone for over an hour just waiting for something to happen. So we need to look a lot more carefully about our candidate experience or process. Look very carefully at every step and how you handle it. Is it smooth? Is it clear? Are there appropriate levels of communication? What's easy on the inside of the company may be really bumpy and rough on the outside. Is it personal? Is it consistent? And so on. Now, let's, let's continue this scenario just a bit farther. Now once you've extended your offer and employment and it's been accepted, yay, usually one of two things happen. Either the employee is ignored until their first day or they're barraged with incredibly dull paperwork. Yes. Now, I understand we all have some paperwork, and that's fine, but do it with a little flair. Cover the, cover the basics, get the boring stuff out of the way, and then send them other information. Make it interesting. Make it job relevant. Send them the, the latest newsletter. Uh, send them a synopsis of what your emerging business issues are. Send them a description of what to expect on their first couple of days. Better yet, send them their onboarding schedule of events so they know who they're meeting with, what they're doing, and they can begin to prepare. One of the best examples I know about is a company that created an online scavenger hunt for their new employees. It was a database company, so the scavenger hunt was designed to familiarize new employees to the various products and the company was designing. And, and it was a hoot. It was thorough. It was engaging. And if memory serves me, if you completed it before your first working day, you won some kind of prize. I, I, I don't think it was a new car, but nonetheless, you got the recognition for completing the scavenger hunt. So again, just to wrap that up, you want to look at your onboarding process along with your candidate experience process and really be ruthless. Look for those flaws and then fix them. Just keep in mind, employee engagement is ultra high when an employee starts a job, and it's up to the business to keep it high. Now, one last thought before I turn this over to Betty. Let me say one more thing. I, I talk a lot, use this phrase, integrated talent management practices. Another way to shift from just recruitment to talent management is to think about aligning talent acquisition more closely with the people who were doing training, the people who were doing talent development, the organizational designers and developers. They should be involved with the people doing employee relations. That's what we're talking about in terms of integrated talent management. And, and the common denominator to that, again, is your organization's business strategy. Oftentimes, recruitment is its own silo, and that is, it can work, but again, I think what we're trying to move toward is to a more integrated approach. So try that approach, and I think you will go a long way towards achieving this talent management mindset. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful. I'm going to turn the floor over now to my colleague, Betty. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You've certainly given us, given us a lot to think about. Hello to everyone from upstate New York. My area of focus today is performance management. And the first question is, how do you improve performance reviews and get management more engaged in developing employees? This is a great question. I'd like to answer it by telling you a story of what we did in one small company that I was working with. This company, like so many others, was using a single performance review form 
for every employee, and it had the same evaluation criteria for every employee. The criteria were things like, does this person have the required knowledge for the job? Do they complete their work on time? Use good judgment? Follow policies and procedures, etc. They're all very important questions, but they were very general. So when we revised the performance review process, we kept a few of those items because they are important, but we changed the entire focus of the review to be more about how employees are contributing to the mission and the goals of the company. We added two new sections to each review. One added objectives for the position that would help achieve the strategic goals of the company for the current year. So tied to the current strategic initiative at the high level of the company. The second new section on the review assessed performance based on the person's own job description. So the performance reviews in this company became customized for each individual job title. And what we did to get management more involved, we, we asked each supervisor to draft those two new sections for each of their positions. It wasn't done in the HR department. It wasn't done by executive management. Each individual supervisor took on that task. So that meant that the supervisors really had to think about the alignment between their staff, their staff's work, and the big picture of the company. That helped engage the managers more in the review process. And that also meant that, that managers needed to sit down and talk to their employees about how their jobs related to that overall mission and strategy of the company. That helped the employees feel important to the organization and really come to understand that they were a part of the company's success. Now, managers in this company also now have to re revise their reviews on an annual basis because they're always incorporating the newest goals and objectives of the company into the review process. So that keeps the reviews fresh. They change every year. It keeps employees engaged in the big picture. And employees know specifically now how their work contributes to the success of the company. And they can um, offer their own opinions and their own suggestions for how to improve their contribution. The review process also includes the professional development piece with specific development initiatives that are unique to the employee. And the new format of the review makes it a lot easier for managers and their staff to see what areas of development would benefit both the company and the individual, because you're looking at both pieces together. So in my mind, this is all about alignment. The alignment among company strategy, performance review, and professional development creates more engagement among employees and also between employees and their managers. The second question, uh, somewhat related, how do you retain employees and improve performance reviews? So I've just spoken about some ways to improve performance reviews. Again, tying individual performance to the company's mission and the company's current goals is key. It helps keep employees engaged by making them feel important. It recognizes that individual con contributions are what are responsible for the company's success. And of course, engaged employees are much, much easier to retain. Again, professional development needs to be a part of the review process. And professional development should focus on growth, not remediation, or it should be expressed in terms of growth. And when you're talking to your employees about growth, think about technical ladders in your organization and not just managerial ladders. Every employee can't become a manager. And many employees wouldn't succeed as managers, so we don't want to set them up to fail. So if you're sure to create te technical growth plans where your employees can learn and grow in their field of expertise, um, they can be successful and they don't have to move into a management role in order to grow. Another key part that that I think is often overlooked is that supervisors need to be trained on the language to use when they're giving performance reviews so that the reviews become motivational and they don't end up coming across as reprimands. One of the things that I like to do is role play and ask managers to role play with each other or with their HR staff before they're delivering performance reviews. And I think it's helpful to role play 
with people who have different communication styles than your own. For example, if you're familiar with the DISC work style assessment tool, I'm a CD. Okay, that means that I'm incredibly picky and I have high standards and I'm very direct. So if I'm giving a performance review to someone who is an S or an I, I could come across as very harsh. If I'm talking to someone who wants to be liked or is more sensitive to criticism, I'm not going to deliver that review in the best way. So I role play my tough conversations with someone who's an S, and I get their feedback on how I'm coming across. On the other hand, the manager who's an S might come across as too nice on a performance review and could benefit from role playing with someone who's a D. So the point is that we want to, in delivering performance reviews, we want to present a fair and balanced review. And we want to ensure that the employee will be able to hear what we're saying without getting defensive or missing the fact that they do have growth needs. So, so think about the language that you're using, your body language, as well as your words, and how you, how you deliver that message and practice it. My next question is, what are performance review best practices? I've spoken a lot about this already, and I'm, I'm certainly a broken record when it comes to alignment. Alignment, alignment, alignment. Align performance with the company's overall mission and strategies. Also include a, a strong focus on professional development. And when you do that, engage your employees. Ask the employees how and where they want to grow, and really listen to them. If you take an advisor approach and offer your own input, listen to your employees and find the commonality. Look for that commonality between what the company needs and what the company's goals are and what the employee's interests are. Look for that intersection. And develop a plan with the employee that works for both them and for the company and implement that plan. I can't stress that enough. Do not develop professional development plan and stick it in a drawer and don't look at it again until the next annual performance review. Review it quarterly, at least with your employee. Make sure that, that it's being worked on. And of course, provide feedback to employees regularly, not just during your annual performance review. Provide situational feedback immediately following either an accomplishment or a mistake that the employee had made. Discuss the impact of their work on the company, the stakeholders, the goals. Tie it all back to what, what the work of the company is. And make performance reviews a regular conversation. Um, stop in, talk to your people, make it a two-way interactive conversation. Keep it informal and keep it regular. How do you get employee buy-in for performance reviews? That's a, that's a great question. You know, I really think we need to rename performance reviews. Employees too often think of them as report cards. I know when I hear the words performance review, I get this image in my head of, of a grade school teacher that I had who was mean and whose teaching method was to instill fear in the students. This is my first grade teacher, and I can still see her face when I hear about performance reviews or report cards. So what if we call them something like, employee growth plans or employee success plans, do something to help take away the negative association. I, I think that would help to create more buy-in from an employee's perspective. But you know, regardless of what you call them, performance discussions should be interactive. Managers really need to listen to employee input. And, and that doesn't mean shy away from issues or problems that, that you have with the employees, but engage them in how to improve and grow. Some managers I've seen only focus on what employees need to improve, and that can shut down that buy-in. Be sure you're also highlighting success and explaining how an employee's achievements contribute to the bottom line. How regular should performance management with coaching be? That's an interesting one. Um, I see coaching as a form of performance management. In my view, they're, they're both about growth. The most effective co coaching that I've seen is sponsored coaching, where the employee supervisor or another senior mentor is engaged periodically with the coaching. When I'm coaching in this type of arrangement, I will meet with the coaching client and their sponsor together and ask the sponsor to weigh in on growth areas for the client and ways in which the 
sponsor can help that person grow. So if I'm meeting with a coaching client monthly, I might bring in the sponsor quarterly or semi-annually and have that discussion together of how the client is doing and specific ways, again, in which the, in which the sponsor can assist with that person's goal. So it engages the sponsor as well as the employee. Okay, I, my time is up. I hope those answers were helpful, and I'm going to pass the baton over to Brett Thompson. Good afternoon. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. I, we just had a, somebody tell me to be quiet for just a moment there. I'm Brett Filson, and I'm in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, Canada's capital city, where today it's snowing. So for all of those of you south who aren't experiencing the white, we are. Um, I'm going to be talking this afternoon about coaching. There's um, several questions here that I'm going to try and answer fairly quickly uh, and um, hopefully provide you with some um, tools that you'll be able to use in terms of coaching. One of the first, the first question we've got is how to use, how do you best use all employee data points to coach for future opportunities? Um, I am a strong believer that we should collect data points and we should use those data points the same way we use everything else. Use it for general impressions of what's going on, not for specific coaching. An example I have is in a healthcare setting where I was managing uh, resources, data points for you use to identify potential challenges within a department, with one department with high, very high turnover rate, a professional department. Recognizing a high turnover rate indicates potential problems within the department or potential management challenges within the department. We uh, have to examine through, in this situation, excellent interviews, uh, and interviews of existing staff to determine what the actual cause of a turnover might be. That, in other words, the data point has indicated the potential problem, so we had a point at which to say we need to evaluate this further. In this particular case, we found out there was a specific manager who uh, needed some management development. A 360 uh, degree evaluation was done. Um, that was in supplementation to the uh, personal interviews. It allowed us to focus on that supervisor's challenges uh, in terms of confidence, his own personal confidence, uh, as well as improving management of his staff. Um, effectively, it reduced the turnover rate in the department very quickly. Second question, how can I improve the coaching skills of managers? Uh, the best way, have the senior managers be good, strong coaches. Um, that's not always an option, but certainly in order to develop skills within an organization, those skills have to be present at the top levels of the organization and work their way down. That's the best approach. Having, if you don't have that, barring that option, working with individuals to teach, allow those students to practice, allow that practice to be, get feedback on the practice. So in front of the coach, um, the student is, is going to try a new skill. As they're practicing that new skill, the coach will make notes and then follow up with a positive feedback. So the basic principles of coaching, positive feedback, negative feedback, what can we do to fix it, and what are you going to do now, practice again. So you might say, that was a really good effort on that process. In order to achieve a better result, try this additional step. When you did this specific thing, the result did not achieve the goal. So this is where we're going to focus our attention now. So you're taking basically then giving them positive feedback, making them feel confident, negative feedback, saying what we need to fix, and then show them the process of how to go forward. If we can get our managers to understand that process, then they're going to be able to lead their staff to uh, better engagement. Now, how do you build engagement from the start of a coaching conversation? Um, it's funny, we actually as a team talked about this last week uh, via email, and uh, because it's a, it's a big challenge getting engagement in, from my perspective. 
in every coaching situation, you need to build rapport with your client. You also have to gain confidence uh, in that new coaching conversation through active listening. Uh, that's the real skill in building relationships. Um, an example, I was approached by a manager to assist with a, a challenging employee. I had to first gain the confidence of that manager. She didn't know me from anybody. I was just coming into a, into a department. From the beginning of the conversation, the first thing that I had to say was, tell me about your role and the relationship you're having with this individual staff member. As the conversation progressed, my role was to ask questions, get clarification on any areas where I was a little fuzzy, mirror the responses she provided. So when she said, we're finding conflict in the situation at the staff meetings where she's challenging me. I needed to get clarification. How was that challenging taking place? And of course, making relevant notes so at the end of the conversation I could recap what the key points were and regain, again, ask for, to verify that I have got the message correctly. Those same skills have to be re reused in every new engagement and it's critical in all of these things to show intense interest in the conversation or the relationship is never going to be built. I had a similar experience with a Harvard University student who asked me to uh, do some career coaching with his son, or with uh, the father had asked me to do the coaching. The, the young man had absolutely no interest in what was going on, didn't believe it was going to do him any good. Uh, we went through the session, built that rapport, and at the end of the first session already, he, he was showing me that he understood that I was listening to him, and he felt that I was not, not directing him, but rather taking in the information he provided. Very effective in terms of uh, uh, overcoming that resistance. Coaching without politics. I think we all know every organization has political situations, uh, but coaching in itself is not political. A good coach recognizes the politics uh, and then works to help avoid uh, having that, you become involved in it. In order to understand the perceived politics, and I truly believe it's perceived more than real, uh, but perception and reality, you know what they are. I've interviewed man managers and staff in a department to appreciate what the politics seem to be. Um, when that's not been an option, the powers of observation and active listening again become critical. Um, one of the questions or one of the comments I might make is, you seem to per perceive that your manager dislikes you more than you than some of the other staff or shows favoritism towards a staff member. Um, it's important to make sure that you do not belittle that person's belief system, but rather recognizing it, um, make a perception of it, and then uh, as a coach remember that you can't assume facts and you can't assume politics. And politics isn't my role. Skill development is my role. So if in fact we've got a manager that's perceived one way by this individual, that's okay. I was still brought in to coach, so the manager must have some positive feelings about this individual. <sighs> How do you come over resistance, overcome resistance to coaching? Um, offer a trial. Reduce price um, for those of us who charge for it. Most importantly, with measurable objectives. Uh, when you're offering um, a measurable objective trial, make sure it's a short-term situation. Uh, if you want to get people to buy in, provide the references. People who you've coached or organizes, organizations that you have coached in are often the most important tools that people are going to use. Um, the other one is to provide some a, a simple coaching. Um, this can be as simple as a as talking through a current challenge. Uh, to build an awareness and approach to dealing with challenges, my job as coach isn't to solve the problems. My job as coach is to instill a methodology to solve problems. Uh, number six, and I know I'm getting tight on time, how do you address the interpersonal challenges that arise in a team when skills are common but personalities are different? different? Um, Betty mentioned the DISC. Uh, personality report, something that uh, um, Talent Guard uses. It's 
again, if we know the personality types, we can work with personality types. Uh, in a small office environment, people will have conflict. Uh, the most effective approach to is that I've used in the past is mediation tools in terms of getting people to speak to one another and trying to get them to see or hear or feel uh, how the other person is affected uh, and where they can come up with common ground. So again, in, in the interpersonal challenges, use the DISC tool or if, if you have other tools that you prefer to use, that's great. Um, remember too though, when you're using a tool, you need to have an understanding of what the results mean. Uh, make sure they're being interpreted correctly. Now, I've got one word. How do we establish, measure, and validate internal coaching? There's some basic principles around uh, any kind of a process like this. We look at it, I look at it as a project. So I'm, I'm looking at setting our goals, designing a plan, including how we're going to get buy-in from senior management, implementing the plan, including internal marketing. Um, making sure you're using all the tools necessary, the uh, uh, social media like Facebook or blogs. Measuring outcomes, using the goals and missions of the program. Uh, and uh, again, I like to use the 360 degree uh, tool, uh, again, as long as it's being interpreted. We modify the program as we're going along. We're always looking for that process improvement. So you review the results, evaluate the outcome, measure change, especially related to company performance change. The next step is to expand the program using more coaches and more clients and students. Again, the coaches need support. Work the, to make the program a permanent part of the organization. Um, follow up, interview the students, see what effect it's had on them, prepare formal confidential written evaluations. Again, this could be that 360 degree process evaluation uh, and the evaluation should be ongoing just like it is with any other performance management tool. It should be going ongoing but you need to start with a benchmark. Uh, again, benchmark 360. Now Linda is going to talk. Hello. Thank you, Brett. Hello, Linda. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So succession planning. How do I get buy-in for succession planning, training, and development? Well, it can be a daunting task to get leadership development and succession planning um, really bought into in an organization. And the most simplest answer, am I, can you hear an echo? Somebody let me know. Steve, get off the phone. Okay. There was an echo on my side. I just had to check the plug. One second. There's a problem over here. Okay. Can you hear me? Sorry, we had we had some problems in the background here. Okay, sorry about that. We usually don't have a problem on this side. So how do you get buy-in for succession planning, training, and development? Well, the first thing you need to do is start the conversation. I see a lot of hesitancy on the part of an HR team to really speak to the CEO or the department heads. And really the conversation should start something like this. What's wrong with um, a specific employee? You know, does this person have the skills to meet our evolving needs? If not, what's lacking? There are some key indicators that um, when you're thinking about succession planning and you're starting to open the conversation in this area, rather than rolling out a big, huge 25-page strategy, if you just start the conversation in an organization that is resistant, that really is a form of succession planning. It, you know, the most, the most difficult thing to do is to get that conversation going. And once you get that conversation going through some of the questions that you ask, then it will naturally evolve um, using that process um, you know, that, that you start with, which are the questions. 
Is it good practice to have a performance management and development in place prior to succession planning? Well, succession planning is typically based on two components. You have potential and you have performance, uh, especially if you're going to be using what we call the talent grid or the nine grid or the development grid. There are many different names for it. And it's ideal that you have performance data and scores on your staff before engaging in succession planning. Now, can you live without it? You can, but I don't think that the data is going to be as rich. So, you know, typically when you're looking at a performance review, that measures behaviors or job role competencies. And then on your grid, you're going to usually have a low, a medium, and a high score. Then you also need to start thinking about when you're looking at potential, what does it really mean to be a high potential in our organization and how is that different from performance? And then how are you going to measure that potential? There are many different tools to measure potential. And then what would typically happen is you'd have your performance score, you'd have your potential scores, and then those two scores would be plotted on a chart and then you would figure out if we're using a nine grid you know, somebody's going to be in a particular box. What I see in a lot of organizations is once somebody is, is um, plotted in that box, they think that's the end. That's really the beginning because when you're in a particular box, let's just say emerging leader, you need to start thinking about for that talent pool, what does the development plan look like for that particular um, individual, for that particular key role, and things of that nature. And and if you can do that, that, you know, that really is going to bring the performance and the potential together so that you can do succession planning in the right way. So how do you get a plan started? Well, the first thing that you need to do, and I think everybody said, uh, said this a little bit earlier, is you need alignment. You need alignment with the senior strategy first. Once you understand where you're going, then you need to identify your key roles and then benchmark those positions. And a couple of questions that you should be asking yourself. Which positions are most critical in achieving current and future goals? Which positions, if vacant, could cause harm to the organization? Which positions require specialized skills and knowledge? Which ones have been hard to recruit for? Do projected labor shortages exist for the skills that you'll need in the future? Uh, workforce data is imperative to succession planning. And then once you understand what some of these key roles are, based on your strategy, you need to look at your staff both today and in the future. Are, you know, they might be right now, but are they going to be right in the future with the right skills? And if not, then what do we need to do internally in terms of a development plan to get them there and how long is it going to take to get them to what people would call quote unquote ready now or develop the bench and things of that nature. Next question, how do you advise setting up a succession planning practice as a company-wide mentality instead of just executives? Well what we're finding and there's been you know more of a trend in the last five or so years to to look at succession planning as an organizational strategy rather than an executive strategy. And it's because people, if you think about the staff and the makeup of your staff in your organization, there are a lot of people and or roles that I say create wealth and or sustainability. It's important to think in terms of strategic roles instead of a specific hierarchy. So once you identify those key positions, then you need to start saying, you know, if we, if we know these key positions are our, what I'm going to quote unquote say A positions, then, you know, do we have the A players in the A positions? And what most organizations do is they just hire for a role and they don't really think, they hire for a job description. It's that recruitment process that Nancy talked about and then everything else gets left behind. If you really want to be a talent management company, Talent management is about role, role definition and development. So that is imperative to do as you're driving that strategy. Then what happens is what, what if you have your A positions and then your B positions, then you have to determine what is the performance variability between those roles. What's the criteria? 
what makes somebody an A or a B player. Uh, more often than not, managers can't, even though they'll say this is my superstar, they're, it's, it's very hard for people to articulate why someone's an A and why someone's a B or why somebody's a number one and why somebody's a number three, depending on what um, ranking systems you use. So think about that as you, um, you know, continue to roll out some type of um, succession planning. And then finally, what are the steps and who do you want to make sure you involve in succession planning? Um, well, succession planning involves many steps and you can see um, a detailed presentation that we did a while ago uh, out on the website where it involves, I think it's like seven steps to succession planning, but so many people are involved in succession planning, all stakeholders. Uh, you know, I say executives must set the vision and be clear on strategic capability. The output of this usually is a company-wide succession competency model. HR's job is to communicate and educate leadership on this model and seek ways to um, assess the talent, help managers figure out what the A, B, and C positions are, as well as helping managers to assess whether A players, again, are in A positions. And then managers must encourage and support development of employees. Now, all this is for not if employees are not engaged and willing participants in the development process. And that goes back to that engagement question that I think everyone touched on today. And that concludes my five questions. So what I'd like to do is just spend uh, just five minutes, you know, talking a little bit about Talent Guard. And then I'd like to take all of your uh, questions. You can, again, submit them per coach or ask in general. Um, you know, Talent Guard is a software company, and you've heard uh, Brett talk about the 360. We do have a performance module, uh, a very um, awesome career pathing tool for development. We have our succession planning tool that helps manage your talent pools and your development tool as well as our learning management system. So if you want to learn anything more, just let us know. And now what I'd like to do is open the panel, and all you have to do is open your question box, and then you can uh, send me a question, and then I will send it out to the group. Any questions? Okay, we have a question here. It just looks like a generic one. What is the difference between succession planning and management development? I think that goes to kind of that, that fourth question on the list where, and I'll take this first and any other coach, just let me know if you'd like to chime in. Um, succession planning really is all about thinking for the future. So, you know, if you have a particular manager in a role and that manager needs to be developed, that's management development. You're going to develop a very specific skill set. If you're thinking about succession planning, you're thinking about developing the bench either based on a particular role profile or based on a particular person profile. Because remember, succession planning can be done based on a person, based on a role, or based on you know, anything in particular, like your, you know, your smart whipper snappers who are going to lead in uh, Latin America. So, you know, one is more immediate and one is more long term. Competencies is a hard thing um, when you're thinking about performance management. I mean, it's it really it's imperative because, you, well, here's the big here's the bigger question: Are you going to use one competency model for your entire organization? And usually, when people do that, I always call that more of a values model. Or are you going to use a competency model? per role. So your competencies for sales are different than marketing or different than engineering. That really is a top-wide strategic um, question that you really need to think of with your team. Um, they both have pros and cons and I've seen both used successfully. So just think about that as you're starting to roll out uh, your talent management strategy. I have a question from Rebecca. What about succession? Okay, what about succession planning for extremely hard to fill positions, uh, where the talent pool is very, very small or aging? That's a that's a tough one. And actually, we were doing a project like this with a major uh, healthcare provider where they have um, a research scientist role, and that role 
Um, you got to be a PhD. Very, very difficult to fill. And what they, because they could not really find anyone from the outside to fill those roles, more of a recruitment strategy, what they had to do is create a career pathing strategy and put very key specific people on the path, including education, you know, like more external education, to develop people internally for those roles, which took, and, and it will take, years for them to develop into those roles. So they have to get, out, get on it on the very, very beginning to identify those key people who they think would be right for those roles and then carry forward. Any other thoughts from our coaches on that? Nancy, maybe? No? Okay, so I have another question from Susan. Have you seen examples of companies implementing internal career management centers where third-party neutral advisors assist employees with career planning? And do you recommend this approach or relying solely on HR and line managers for this type of career coaching? Uh, I can attempt that question first and then, you know, anybody else, please chime in. We actually did this for Austin Energy. So Austin Energy had a team of HR um, HR professionals or HR practitioners and um, the big, you know, set your hair on fire issue for Austin Energy is that 30 percent of their workforce is retiring in less than four years and that's going to be a major impact to that organization. So what they wanted to do was establish an internal career center. So we trained all of their coaches as PCMs. We actually designed the career center, filled it with resources and then they rolled out an entire internal career coaching program that I think is a good example. And it, 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 I mean, in the beginning, it was one of the first that we had done. We didn't think that it would get a lot of traction, but the traction was so overwhelming that they had to expand the program and get more coaches. And now it's just part of their integrated process. Um, and that didn't take, I mean, it didn't take too long to get it started. I'd say the project from start to finish was probably two months or so. Um, coaches, have you seen another example of setting up a career center internally within some of your client organizations? No? We, have, we haven't actually seen an example of a career center being set up. A lot of the organizations that I've dealt with in Canada simply don't have the resources to do that. Got it. Yeah, normally what I would see first and foremost um, is an organization training a few key coaches, you know, it could be like a mini coaching center, but they train a few key coaches that operate as part of the HR team. And then as, as those coaches get traction, they would expand the program from there. And that ends up being a career coaching center. Any other questions? I know I've had a lot of questions. Um, and I'm trying to scroll down the list to make sure I don't miss anything about making sure this presentation is available. Yes, it'll be available. It won't be our best recorded one. I apologize about that again. But it will be. Um, what will happen is we will post this presentation to, to the Talent Guard website under Resources. And um, under Resources, you'll see the title for the webinar. All you do is click on it, and then, then that will lead you to both downloading the um, PDF of the PowerPoint, and you can also have the audio um, downloaded as well. It's really up to you. Um, one other question we got, um, what is your opinion of ICF? That is the International Coach Federation. Uh, coaches, do, um, are any of you members of ICF? No? Well, um, I, I am not. I took some of my initial training through ICF, mm -hmm. but life happened and I was never able to complete my, uh, my actual certification. But I did take most of the, the classes and I found it helpful. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, one of the things that I think of when I think of organizations like this is really, you know, the mission and the intent to create standards to create awareness, uh, to provide consumer information on what to expect, to, you know, set some standards in terms of levels, you know, 
types of training for coaches and staying up to date. I think that that is a, I mean, that is a good mission to have. And, you know, I wouldn't knock that for anything because it's really hard to do that, especially in a market that's so unregulated. You just don't know what you're going to get and which coaching is it works and which training doesn't and what's a real certification versus a certificate. Um, but, you know, I do think that they have a good mission and that they, they are, you know, they're out to make sure that, you know, the public is aware of what coaching really is. This is Betty. I do think it's important to make sure when you're working with a coach or hiring a coach that um, they do have credentials. Um, as Linda mentioned, all of us on this on this call today are credentialed by CalCard as professional career managers. ICF also credentialed coaches and has worked with coaches who were credentialed um, through ICF. And as Linda was saying, it gives it provides a standard. These organizations, Talent Guard, ICF, all of these standard, standardizing organizations also have codes of ethics that they require the coaches to follow. And I think it's just important when you're evaluating coaches to find out how they're credentialed, what their experience is, what code of ethics they follow, and that these organizations have an important role when it comes to that. Yep, I agree. And I think one of the things that um, Brett said earlier when, um, when when he was talking about you know the the coaching and really to pick up on what you're saying, Betty, our credentials are important because when we were researching the market on how many different career credentials are out there, there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of credentials, and it's really hard um, you know to rise above the noise. So research is important. Um, you know, understanding the types of people that are that are getting trained by those credentials are also very important. Any other questions? I want to be respectful of everybody's time since we said that this was 60 minutes in length, uh, but I'm happy to take one or two more if you uh, have any other questions. I'll wait here just a second or two. No? Well, I want to thank you so much. I'm very grateful for your patience and your time today. Um, we really do, uh, uh, you know, love your questions. And what we're going to do as a follow-up, in addition to posting the webinar, is we are going to, um, each of the coaches is going to get a little bit more extensive in their answers, and they're going to be guest bloggers on our blog.talentguard.com. In the next coming days, we're going to post um, uh, one topic per day so that you can also so have you know some kind of scripting if you need that to help support you and your initiatives inside your company. So thank you so much, everyone.